And good morning. I am Bill Hand here with you with the uh, North Carolina History Theater podcast. And with me is our good buddy, Simon Spaulding. Good morning, good sir. Good morning. And you see us sitting out here with our little cup of tea, tea soon to come, with a uh, little finger up to hold it properly. We've got ourselves some lovely crumpets right crumpets. here. Have a crumpet, yes. sir. Yes, I love and, a bit of crumpet. And um, we are being... Truly Southern Genteel here because our special guest today is the amazing and most Southern lady I have ever known, Miss Sylvia Whitford. I don't see if you know if you can see her there pouring our tea. Thank you. Sugar, milk. Wonderful. Shall, shall I reach over and pour bills? Yes, please, please. Uh, feel free to pour yourself a cup while you're all waiting. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Tea and crumpets. Tea and crumpets. Behind and, uh, the, the Slover House Yes, and uh, Sylvia, please come on in and join us. Here we go. <laughs> now, we're kind of a trio here. We've known each other a good while, all three of <laughs> this us. Is so Sylvia and I first met when Simon was my boss. Yes. And um, I, I, I was saying, that's just one of the better bosses I've ever had. He did not look over my shoulders <laughs> too close. He did not micromanage me. If you micromanage me, I'm going to get fired. That's how it goes. Uh-huh. And Sylvia was, and I were first-person interpreters over at Tryon Palace. Simon and his fine bride, Sarah, oversaw that program at the time. And uh, I'm being handed butter and other things. You know, I've never had a crumpet in my life. I've never even known what a crumpet was. A crumpet actually is the English original of what in this country we call an English muffin. Correct. But but the English muffin is not quite a crumpet. It's not quite as chewy. And English muffins are usually sliced open, whereas a crumpet is usually not sliced. Well, we'll call this a southern crumpet. Mm -hmm. A southern Mm -hmm. crumpet, indeed, indeed. Thank you, madam. Crumpets traditionally have um, kind of air bubbles in them and are very chewy. But these are um, and these made with whole wheat flour. And would our producer mm-hmm. like what as I step out of the camera here? Help yourself to a crumpet, sir. Thank you. Tea and crumpets. And we'll pass you the butter. So as you can see behind the camera, he's enjoying it as well. And you take, <laughs> if you all turn around real quickly, <laughs> you might see him. <laughs> That's how television works. That's how video works. It's, it's amazing. So, um, Sylvia, good morning. Good morning. And uh, Sylvia is an expert on all things colonial. She's got an amazing garden out front of her little house here. And uh, tell us a little bit about the house we are sitting at, by the way. This is a very unique and important house in the history of New Britain. Well, let me think about it. It was the kitchen, smokehouse, and servants' quarters for the big mansion next door. Uh, you might see, uh, are, are we seeing it? The Slover House at all there behind us there? Yeah. All right. Behind us is the Slover House. It was built in, what, the very early 1800s? 18, oh, yeah, 1848. Yeah, yeah. Okay. It was a fairly new house when it was the department. Okay, of. and um, upon the fall of New Bern in the Battle of uh, New Bern back in 1862. March 14th. Uh, March 14th, yes. Uh, that house became the headquarters of the Union Army. Uh, as the Union Army came in and the locals all ran and the battle was lost so quickly and I suspect the Southerners were so convinced of the inferiority of the Yankees that they didn't believe it would fall. And they ran out on trains leaving behind dinner and food and many of their slaves. And one of the and slaves, one train car was was un- accidentally uncoupled. Yes, one was uncoupled. <laughs> all, all the whole the fascinating story about that and one of these days we're going to get into it. But one of the slaves Not here today. was named Mary Cord, and there's a Mark Twain story, and if you've seen me do Mark Twain, you've heard this story, called The True Story, and he talks about an Aunt Rachel. Well, Aunt Rachel in reality was Mary Cord, and she was a slave who lived in the quarters that we are sitting by. Uh, could you swing the camera around just long enough to show the house here a little bit there? Maybe you can. You're going to have a rather rough change of the video here. There it is. Uh, this is a slavery dependency. It was, slave, it was the slave quarters and the cookhouse, and it was here that Mary Cord prepared the dinners for generals. And um, so it, it's got a long history there. Now, later on, the house became the home of one Caleb Bradham. And if you live in New Bern and you don't know who Caleb Bradham was, you might be thrown out of the city. 
But uh, Caleb was, of course, the inventor of Pepsi Cola back in 1898, I think. And that was his home at that time. And uh, I guess, I suppose he owned this property as well at the time. Yes, yeah, yeah, right. Yes, he was yeah, the owner of this property as well. So, uh, so this, is, this is his garage right there. Yes, we have a, a big brick open building beside us with no roof. And, uh, which Sylvia is also owner of right now. But uh, tell us a little more about the house. Now, Sylvia came here and she purchased this house, I believe, after Hurricane Floyd Correct. pretty Florence. much destroyed the interior. Florence. Florence. It was Florence. Uh, did I say mm -hmm. Floyd? Yeah, it was Florence. I knew it was Florence. That was my, my, my tongue confused me. Okay, Florence, not Floyd. Have more? No, I'm Yes, Florence is ancient. Was Floyd is ancient history. So tell us about some of the work you did getting this place together. Well, the for sale sign stayed out front for months, and I kept begging anybody in my mind to please buy that house because I did not want to renovate another house. But nobody bought it, so I got my carpenter to, to come and look at it with me and decide if we could manage it. And he said yes, so we took took it on as a project. It was a huge project. What else should I tell you? Well, tell us a little bit more about what had to be done to it. And the house was completely gutted, or just about completely gutted, at least on the first. Well, not floor. really. It, it had just lost its floor. Okay. But the room. And the lower walls. Yeah, the walls were still there, and the okay. lower walls, correct, right? But that's what we did. We just put new floors in and, and, uh, and did what you usually do when you renovate a house. Okay. And it's a, a very, very lovely addition to the city now. It's oh. Nice to see everything has been done to it. There's a, yeah. there's a, a little bit about your garden out here. Now, now um, Sylvia, when she was at the palace, did a lot with herbs and that type of thing. She's reflected that in the garden. Now, you are, you're 90 years old now. Yes. And um, still very active. If I can be as active as this at 90, I'll be more than happy to make it. But she's out there doing her own gardening, uh, and planting corn and squash. And, um, well, I'm trying to create the front yard as if it still belongs to that house as their backyard. So that's why we're growing vegetables out mm -hmm. front. Well, that plus I just like to grow vegetables. Yeah. And, the, and the backyard is just too small. She used to live about two or three blocks over that way, up into town. And I remember walking by her house once in a while, and there's, it's got a big cornfield going up beside her driveway. It was just the most curious thing. Yeah. So, so Bill asked me then, uh, what do the neighbors think about this? And I said, they love it as long as I keep giving them corn, <laughs> which was true. And we've got a cornfield out front today as well, did yeah, not? Right. Right. I see some, uh, some chickens as well. Yeah. And some chickens. We should have had them for honor if we'd have only known. Oh, right. Yeah, why just one chicken? Maybe, 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 a whole flock maybe for process. the next project you'll have a whole flock. It's in, our, yeah, it's in our recent play, <laughs> Honor, the musical about the duel between Stanley and Spade. We, I have always insisted on having a live chicken during our show. Hmm. And, uh, my, just for that show or, or every show? Yes. Yeah. But have to, yes. we'll have to find some way to stick a chicken in the next one, too. I don't know how yet, but... <laughs> Not unreasonable, given the locale. <laughs> I just ate those four chickens. Uh -huh. But in any uh, case... Well, uh, there were those as well. Who were they giving away? To yeah, actually, tame more chickens than these, and I'll, I'll, I'll put you in contact with the people that own them. Now, what kind of chickens do you have here? Rhode Island we have. Yeah, Rhode Island. Mm. Okay, that would have been my guess. They're not laying yet. They're still pullets. Okay. And that's when you grab one leg on either side and yank. Hence the name pullet. <laughs> Never mind. I don't think so. Where is my fiddle when I need it to do my, my laugh track? <laughs> uh, so, so let's talk a little bit about the... Uh, you, you've done a lot of, of gardening work that is historic. And you continue to do a little bit of that. Right. Um, you were telling me about those those little uh, what do you call them? The the bags that had to do with the hoodoo. Tell us about that. Uh, how you used to do that? Put, put those together. Say that again. The hoodoo bags. The uh, oh, you were telling right. about this right before the show. Right. Uh, well, I used to I used to be the apothecary at the palace, so I had to look into every element of of being a root a root doctor. 
and I came across the fact that, that there were mojo bags were very popular amongst the black people that lived here because this year was 1835. So I started as part of my demonstration of being uh, the apothecary. I started making these little voodoo uh, uh, mojo bags. And they were so popular that that was the main thing that I talked about with, with visitors that came. They wanted to know more about these than they did the medicines, <laughs> <laughs> which was very interesting. Well, everybody wants to be loved, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah mo mo uh, so mojo's, mojo's are, is, a, is, a, is a love charm. Yeah, so, so what were they made of and what, how, how are they used? Oh, they're how cotton. Are they and, and for some reason, the color red is important. That should be hmm. red. And that's just about the only thing I can remember. Okay, and what kind of, what kind of herbs or things were in the bag? Oh well, I put I put always put rosemary. Rosemary is for remembrance. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I, I would make these little uh, mojo bags, and I would put um, rosemary in, and then I would give it to the person that was so interested in it. And you have to make them by hand because there were no sewing machines then. So I just sew these little things by hand. Yes. And then they are supposed to put a lock of their hair. And, and hide this mojo bag on the person they want to love them. And that will happen. Uh, Y'all just excuse me while I forgot to turn off my phone, folks. And there we go. So they have been as a, as a kind of remembrance, as a kind of a love potion, or? Yes. Well, they all also use for evil, but I never mentioned that. <laughs> no. They're, so, they're, they, they serve both purposes, but I never mentioned the evil part. All right, so you could find your love or you could supposedly curse somebody. Yes. Of course, they're having a bag laid on me and you don't like me. I'm going to get a little suspicious, I would think. <laughs> Here, just tie this to your apron strips. <laughs> don't worry about it. Don't, don't even, but otherwise, it was what we might call love potion number eight. And Moja is in, I'm trying to remember which of the West African languages it is, where it means like coming together and you know, love uh -huh. and connection. So it's, uh, it's definitely a... Uh, well, yesterday, yesterday after, after, after well, I found my, I found my, my, the basket that I used for my pop carry work, mm -hmm. and I found these little mojo bags, and I had totally forgotten that, that I had made okay. them. So I decided I would Google it again yesterday, so that's why I even remember. Mm -hmm. Well, even, even today, we have quite a bit of superstition. And, oh, uh, yes. Back in that day, the 1830s, uh, you, you had not only superstition among the blacks, but also among the oh, whites. Yes. Of course, some blacks, they're, they're raised without a loud in education. They've got only the, the, their uh, cultural background to go by and so on. So, of course, the superstition rises up that much more strongly among them. Um, I don't know, Ben, ben Watford. The uh, Potter and his story, and he makes those incredibly ugly jugs of his. Correct. And he will tell you they're incredibly ugly. That's the whole point to them. Right. And the story he tells about those, and if you know Ben, you've got one of these jugs. You have no choice. And but they're fascinating little things. Big ceramic jugs with cork popped in. Big jugs. In the day, as he explains it, many of the slaves were not allowed to put up a tombstone when they buried their dead. So instead, they set the jug there, and the jug had this horrific face on it. And of course, the face was to scare away the bad spirits, and therefore protect the dead. Um, but but you read uh, in, in any of the books of the day. If you read uh, Mark Twain when he refers to a Huckleberry Finn and Tom Sawyer, and he talks about the kids and and explains all the incredible superstition these kids would, kids would have. They'd be swinging a dead cat around in the graveyard and hurl it to try and cure, cure a ward. And, and other things he described about that. So it's it's kind of interesting just to look at the all the, the weird superstitions of the time. But then you knock on wood ever? Uh, I, yes, I do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and uh, I mean, we do that automatically. We say, oh, knock on wood. And but that's that yeah, yeah, that yeah, the superstition. The old yeah. don't walk under a ladder, which actually Correct. has some sense to it. Um, the, yeah, yeah. the black cat, depending on the culture in America, it's bad luck. In other cultures, it's good luck. We <laughs> got black cat. Oh, well, only so if they cross the road in front of you. We used to always cross it. Uh -huh. Like a cross. Mm -hmm. Uh huh. Which magpies is, in England, there are superstitions about magpies. I don't know about that one. 
it's a story about uh, uh, an English folk musician who gave an old lady a, a ride, and every time she um, she saw a magpie, she would spit and say, devil, devil, I defy thee. And he was sort of a, displeased about this because she was spitting in his car. <laughs> but, uh, and then he wrote a song. He wrote a song based on that. It's used in the uh, series uh, The Detectorists. Okay. In, uh, in a wonderful English fictional series about two two guys who go out with metal detectors mm. and, and, you know, hope, hope to find treasure. And one of the songs in there is the song of this English folk musician whose name escapes me. I'm sorry yeah. to say. Uh, uh, wrote about, about the magpie. And this, so... I think what's interesting about these, to me, about these southern traditions, is there are traditional beliefs from West Africa, and traditional beliefs from England, and right. maybe a few from Scotland and Ireland as well. Right. But in this area, especially mm -hmm. England, that um, you know all sort of come together and they may reinforce each other. Mm -hmm. When we were developing the John Canoe program at, uh, mm -hmm. uh, it, it, at at the palace, that was something very interesting to see how some of these festival traditions that take place right after Christmas or around that time of year, that there are traditions that are English, indigenous English traditions, and indigenous West African traditions that seem to have sort of reinforced each other in, in Jamaica. And, and you've uh, got a lot of your burial superstitions mm -hmm. in this town. Uh, one of the ghost walk sketches we used to do was some grave diggers and they're going over all these rules when you carry the dead man out of the house, close all the doors behind so the spirit can't sneak back in. And of course, the, the great tradition at uh, Cedar Grove there, if you walk through the gates and it weeps on you, the weeping gates, you'll be the next one to come in feet first. <laughs> and, and the gate does weep. It's made out of old marl, which is an incredibly porous stone. Yeah. And so when it rains, it holds that water for a couple yeah, days. Yeah, and even on a sunny day, it might drift or weep on you as you go yeah. through. So, uh, whenever you walk in that cemetery, look up. Yeah. Or, or you might be looking for real estate for your own. Sure. Don't let it drip on uh, you. Yeah. Now, tell us about some of the other things you did with the herbs, uh, the medicinal herbs. What kind of flowers might we have in our own gardens today or other plants that, that would have been seen as medicine back in the day? Oh, yes. Well, I've got fox gloves uh -huh. going down. That, that, um, you make digitalis from fox gloves. Which or is, make a nice salad for someone you don't oh, like. Right. Well, 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 I was going to add that. It is poisonous. It's a highly poisonous plant, yes. Right. Medicinal uses mm -hmm. and, as uh, many poisonous substances. Uh, are. Now, did rosemary have a, have a medicinal purpose at all? Or oh yes, other yeah, than everything I've got planted there does. Mm -hmm. Go over a few. Of them. Tell us a few of the different kinds of plants and what they are used for. Well, well Simon, you could probably come in on this too. Well, you, you, make, you can make a, in a good uh, herb tea from rosemary. Mm. I've got um, bergamot. That's, that's also good tea. I really can't get it there. I've got lamb's ear. That used, that's, that, that's a long, fuzzy, silver plant, and you use it for bandage. Kind of like aloe, or? I've got aloe. That's uh -huh. for burns. But this is for an open wound. You put a lamb's ear over it because you didn't have fabric. Okay. You so didn't have you fabric. So to actually replace a physical bandage. Correct. Right. <coughs> okay. Well, I need to be out in the garden so I can <laughs> so I can see it. <laughs> I can tell you about it when I see it. So, uh, Simon, do you remember any of the, the various herbs and so on that used to grow at the palace, or probably still do grow, that, that had that kind of approach? I know the kitchen had a lot of that. Um, when I worked there, I could have told you, you know, yeah. right off the top of my well, head. Well, this and, little garden over here in front of my awesome. rain barrel is, uh -huh. uh, I'm growing peppermint there, and that's, I call that my schnapps garden. Okay. <laughs> One huh? thing I do remember about the garden is that we... I talked a lot with Carlton Wood when he, and, and Perry Matthews when they were the main gardeners there about what, well, first of all, how much of a garden did they really have? Because mm -hmm. the palace was being put up quickly, but Tryon's attention was really on putting putting down the regulator movement and preparing for the battle of what turned out to be the Battle of Alamance. And so 
there was a question of how, how much gardening there really was. Uh, and then second to that was what they would have grown there because at that time, in 1770, there were local farmers bringing in their produce and selling them at, at uh, the wharf that is close to what is now Union Point. Um, it, wouldn't, it didn't extend so far out into the, 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 into the rivers at that time, but there, but there was a lively market. And, and the thought we had was that, that probably the, the cook and the housekeeper might have sent servants to what is now Union Point um, to buy things like, like corn and maybe rice coming up from South Carolina and commodities like that. And what they might have grown if they did much gardening there at the palace were things like strawberries and asparagus that require a lot of special attention that you couldn't just buy from, from the local, local farmers. Um, at the wharf, and that, that that I do remember. I don't remember so much the okay. the names of the actual herbs we had. Oh, and I put signs. It has up. been a while. I had one thing that I did introduce, and I think they may still do, was that uh, when I was in Sweden, I got to to walk through the garden of the botanist uh, Carl Linné, or Linnaeus, he's sometimes known by the Latinized version of his name. And something that was really intriguing me about his garden was that he had roofing slates uh, that he had put there and had carefully painted the names of whatever it was that he, um, that he had there. And uh, it was just lovely. And, and by the way, it's, it's, it was all originally painted by him. And so there are people who work in the, in the garden whose job it is, it, it, when the paint starts to chip away, to carefully retouch the, the, the painted. It's the scientific names, of course. He was a botanist. Uh, on, but but what he used were, were roofing roofing slates, which were actually slate, of course, in Sweden. And um, so I got the idea that since we had work workers at the palace who were make, who were uh, uh, using a fro to um, to split out shakes that, you know, that could be could be used in roofing, that we should use those and paint the names of whatever we were and it was something a little based on Carl and May's garden. Whether they really would have done that here, I don't know. But it was a nice detail from an actual 18th century garden that I saw in Sweden. And so I introduced that, that we had the woodworkers splitting uh, splitting shakes, and then the shakes would be used as, as, as signs in the garden and uh, had character interpreters such as yourselves and, and others painting uh -huh. painting them for you. Said. Maybe you still do that at the palace, I don't know. But that was something I introduced based on the botanical garden of Carl mm -hmm. Lunay in Uppsala, Sweden. Okay. Now, we were first person, as in we pretended to actually be people of that period. Yeah. And I think they, they pulled away from that to a large extent. You still see a little of it, but mostly it's just third person there in the costume. They explained the way of how things were done, but they are a modern person explaining the past. Yeah. But, I mean, it's still interesting, but I kind of enjoyed the, the role play. Oh, it was great fun. Uh, it, it, for some of us, and there are a few of us who uh, absolutely refused to get into it, but uh, yeah, there was or either refused or just or just couldn't. You know, yeah, wild horses yeah. couldn't yeah. drag them into character. I mean, but, we had a young yeah. man for a little while, and he was constantly going to these very modern comedy routines. He just couldn't help himself. But it was it was entertaining to watch though. Oh, sure. Um, in any case, and uh, you are are you a native here to New Boone? No, um, I grew up in the country. Okay, or but around the, the area. We came to town, which mm -hmm. was Newborn, every Saturday. Okay. And uh, now, when we had that little conflict called World War II, how old were you then? Oh. Do you have memories of it at all? I do, but no, I have no idea how old I was. Okay. 15, 14, 13. Okay. Sure. But do you remember Pearl Harbor? Oh yes, I do. I do remember. No, I'm, 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 always alive, I'm always interested to hear the Pearl Harbor stories. Uh, oh. I've done some research. Oh, I don't have any Pearl Harbor that. stories, but I don't <laughs> well, remember. What happened? Where, where were you? Where were you? Found you? Out? How did you find out? It was on a Sunday Japanese morning, Street. and most people came home after church to hear it on the radio. Oh, we we drove. I was living in Little Washington at the time, mm -hmm. and we drove to my grandparents' house, and I got out of the car and ran over to tell my my aunt mm -hmm. that what had happened that's the only thing i remember, that's what you remember. but we did have a cousin mm -hmm. who was at pearl harbor when it happened. so oh, maybe that's goodness. why we were so worried about pearl harbor because okay. we knew he was stationed there 
Wow. Yeah, yeah, we, now, I know we had we had one fatality there anyway from out in the country. Um, Moses Allen was his name, and he was uh, from a sharecropper family. Mm-hmm. And he was, a, what do you call the guys who worked down in the kitchen on the ships? Either a cook or a steward. And, uh, but he was very, he was apparently very beloved among the crew. And uh, I, I forget which ship he was on, but uh, when a bomb went off and it struck in the kitchen or in that area and killed him. Um, but of course, the next day or a few hours later, we had our other casualty, but he was not there. He was out in Wake Island. And that was. Uh, mm. Uh, That's amazing. Condiment. Wake Island is known as Strawberry Condiment, and he was a pilot, and uh, he was running for his airplane as Japanese bombers were coming through in the straits and was killed as he was running for the airplane there. Wow. And those are our two first casualties for the war here. I can remember my father talking about it a little bit, and he just said how he was in Baltimore, a kid in Baltimore at the time. And he said, you remember, everybody heard about the bombing of Pearl Harbor. Everybody's running around yelling, they bombed Pearl Harbor, they bombed Pearl Harbor. And they all stopped and said, where's Pearl, where's Pearl Harbor? Harbor? <laughs> of course, back then, it was just a little tiny town on a little territory. Uh, yeah, it was in the territory. Uh, that, wasn't that a teeny tiny town. Pearl Harbor is, is the harbor of Honolulu. Which yes, is, but I mean, yeah, which which is, as far as we would understand. It was a pretty big city of that. And it had a, a huge base there. but uh, Absolutely. And in fact, they had no idea of it. They moved a lot of the Navy's ships from Bremerton and San Diego to Pearl Harbor, expecting that the Japanese might attack the Philippines, as indeed they did, but not expecting that the Japanese were going to try a, a knockout punch to uh, Pearl Harbor. Thank goodness the carriers weren't there. You know, world, world history would have been very different. Had the U.S. Very carriers been, mm-hmm. been, in, uh, been in Pearl Harbor and the Japanese attacked. So what was it like growing up back in the day? 40s and 50s. Uh, for, for the young folks who, who see how everything is today with the TV well, and the Game, Game Boys and everything. We, we took a bath in a pan of water. Uh-huh. Our only source of, source of water was a pump on the back porch. Had an outdoor toilet, of course. Now, did you have electricity? Oh, no. No electricity. You know, one thing I was surprised about when I started doing a lot of interviews with people out in the country, there was even in the 40s, there was no electricity. Correct. Right. We were chopping corn, weeding corn. We, we, our, our house had been wired for a year, mm-hmm. waiting for the electricity to come through. And we were working out in the field, and we were coming home, and the, the, the back porch light was off. Off. So we had electricity. Ah, that was true. The, first, the first thing we bought was a washing machine. <laughs> Yeah. And the second thing was an iron. Yeah. So you didn't have to heat it on the hearth anymore. Right. Now, did you take turns using the same bath? Was it dumped between, or? What? When you, when the you, different when the kids took the bath, did everybody use the same water? Oh, no. Dump out in between? Oh, no, 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 no. We just pumped your water. Okay. But the, the nice thing about growing up that way is when, <coughs> when, we, when we had children, we started camping. And I was the only one that could take a bath in a pan of water. My children could not take a bath in a pan of water. They just wouldn't do it. Uh-huh. <laughs> but I could. It's what you grew up with. Well, I, actually, and after I became an, uh, an adult and started traveling, mm-hmm. I would go to England, and I would never use, I would stay in bed at breakfast there, and I would never use the bathroom down the hall to take a bath. I would take a pan of water because I could do that. In my room for privacy. Yeah. Okay. As, so as so many people did. Advantages to growing up. Yeah. Like that. Yeah. Absolutely. And um, that really was the norm. Uh, yeah. You know, uh, I'm thinking a little bit earlier, uh, thinking about a certain family in Dayton, and the fact that they didn't have electricity or running water in their house either, which was built in 1969. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, uh, yeah, it, it's those guys went on building airplanes. Right. Yeah. It's it's it's. it's Amazing, I think, for a lot of people to realize what people went without within living memory. Mm-hmm. Well, I think we got a good taste of it working at the Hay House at the Palace. Mm. Yes, yes, we did. Uh, among the things I learned at the Palace was uh, 
how totally inefficient the fireplace is to heat a really cold house in the winter. Um, yeah. You think just light up a fireplace and everybody's dripping down their t-shirts yeah. and blood on it. Like, no, you're standing within two feet of that fire trying <laughs> to get warm. Trying to get warm. And then on the hot days, now this is something supervising you, all, all of you. I remember I kept telling people again and again and again on a really hot day, you need to open the windows and close the shutters. And that was something I learned in Switzerland in a, uh, staying in a... Um, uh, uh, an old farmhouse in in Finn, in not far from Braunfeld, in uh, <coughs> in uh, Canton Turgau in northeastern Switzerland. Whenever it was hot, which wasn't as much there as here, um, uh, my, my my friend who lived in the house would always close all the shutters. They had the, louv the louvered shutters had the louvers like slightly open, uh, but but close all the shutters and open all the windows and you get a nice cross breeze there. But I remember day after day on those hot days, I would come to the hay house and everyone would have the windows all tight because people were used to having air conditioning. But there was no air conditioning in the hay house. And say, like, folks, you need to close the shutters and open the windows. I can't remember how many times I told that people. So they're just uh -huh. smoldering in the hay house with all the windows closed and the shutters open. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, and... Um also learned how, how little light a candle provides. Uh, yes. You, you used to see, I used to see all these old paintings of all these old things, everything so dismal and dark. It's like, why didn't they brighten it up? It's like, well, that's because that's light the light. world they saw. <laughs> Absolutely. To them, that was probably pretty yeah. bright. And you could augment a candle to light, like with a sconce. Mm -hmm. If a sconce right. has some kind of mirror, at least polished yep. metal behind it, that'll send the light forward. You can, uh, with a lantern, uh, you can sometimes... Uh, if you have glass panels, you can have one or two of the panels be be mirrored, mm -hmm. you know, uh, silvered on the back to make the mirrors, and that'll give you a little bit more life. But, uh, yeah, they used to say that uh, Samuel Johnson occasionally caught his wig on fire while he was reading. Uh, Samuel yeah. Johnson, the big guy in England from way yeah. back when. Yeah. And uh, if you're a little bit myopic and all you've got to read by is a candle, I can see you have to down so low to get the game up like to read that you have that wig would catch up. I think so, I would so. take off my wig to read. Sure. If I'm reading in my own my own home, I think I'd take off my wig. Maybe perhaps Dr. Johnson was a little bit uh, vain. Dr. Johnson was, I believe, the author of the first dictionary of English language. I think so, yes. Uh, in college, we had to read Boswell's The Life of Johnson. It required reading. That was the first book that I celebrated the end of the class by going down to the river, climbing out on this catwalk on this bridge halfway out, dropping it and watching it float away. I hated that book. <laughs> <laughs> but it was a fascinating. His story. London diaries Probably are a little bit a little bit spicier. Yeah, more, they make they make for more interesting reading for yeah, poor at least for a teenager, Boswell. which I was when I read it. Uh, uh, now, what did you do for entertainment? When you were a teenager, what, what was entertainment? What did you do on a Saturday? Oh, we had a country store. Okay. We all gathered at the country store. And by the way, uh -huh. when my husband was a teenager, they did the same thing. And uh, and they told ghost stories. And he had to walk home after dark. And uh, he saw a ghost. The golden arm. A real ghost, a white ghost. And it, you know, it terrified him. So he ran the rest of the way home and tried to convince his everybody that he had seen a ghost well as it turned out somebody was deer hunting and shot an albino deer oh. so he had seen something white and that's what it was oh I'm my goodness that. <laughs> all right oh. that interesting. was that was interesting so you you just go to the country store uh yeah, open a bottle out. something to drink and hang out and talk yeah. Mm. Okay. yeah great great place to bring people together. Moja, yeah. Moja, mm -hmm. because they, right. in its original sense. Yeah. Well, the old town, you had the drug stores. Uh, yeah. Those the big hangout spot back in time. You had the, the soda turf, drinking the sodas, and the jukebox playing the music. Back in the world, we had a couple of what? Clark's Drug Store, and what was the other big drug store? Right by the railroad station. Um, Pimmits. Okay. Pimmits. And then they were the hot spots during the war for, for young men and women, for uh, soldiers coming into town. Uh, oh, so yeah. In Cherry Point, that, that was where you went back in the day. And of course, you had the USO and all that at the time, too, as, as well. The uh, the big garden clubhouse down there at Union Point. And that was the making of Havelock, speaking mm -hmm. of Cher Cherry Point. Uh, I remember in um, uh, 
on one of the old county offices, there's a map of Craven County from the 1930s. And Havelock is, is like Jasper. Uh, you know, it's just a, just a little blip in the road. Right. And then when the Marine Corps decided to establish an airfield there, and mm -hmm. people find Corsairs, I think, the F4U uh, Corsair, wonderful, yeah. slightly strange looking airplane, uh, that, that, that was the beginning of Havelock. Mm -hmm. Was, was during the war, is what I understand. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, Terry Point was uh, one part of their credit because they did manage to take out a U boat in their airplanes. Uh, what my father was trained to do, right but never did. <laughs> when did uh, when did picture films come to Newburn? Like motion pictures? Yeah, like motion pictures. Like when did like Newburn get like a, a, a movie theater and all that? Is there the movies at all that was here in, in Newburgh? Oh, yeah, we'd go to the movies. Was that the, the Masonic? Masonic? Yeah, we, yeah, we would come to town on Saturday uh -huh. and usually take in a movie. Yeah, you had Masonic, Masonic. you had, uh, now was, it was, Kehoe. was the Civic playing films and... That was not the Kehoe, was it? No, no, the Civic Theater. The Kehoe was a, I don't think the Kehoe exists anymore, okay. But I remember it was a Kehoe, there was a black theater, there was a white theater. We always went to the, the Masonic. Mm -hmm. For movies. Uh -huh. Double feature on Saturday. Uh -huh. Okay, what were some of your favorite movies? You remember any oh, of them? None. What was your favorite kind of movie? I don't even remember that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> There's somebody up there talking on the screen and uh, he paid you a <laughs> We did have talking stuff. No, you did have talking. <laughs> we did have talking. <laughs> You're not that old. <laughs> uh, back with Wings and those other old uh, silent movies. So. Um, now, what did it cost to go to a movie? You remember that at all? Say that again. What did it cost to go to a movie oh, back in the day? It was, I think it was like a nickel or a dime. Probably a dime. Mm -hmm. And was that a, a regular thing? Was that just a special treat once in a while? No, we did it every Saturday. Every yes. Saturday. Okay. Uh, maybe our parents put us in the, in the movie theater and then did their shopping. That's uh -huh. probably uh, what happened. Ah. Uh, yeah. The, the original version of the TV as a babysitter. <laughs> that's, I expect that's what happened. It, it shut up. So they would go to the grocery store and buy hour. groceries. And sure. Yeah. And so were you living, you say, near in or near Little Washington at that time? Or were you in Craven County? I was in Craven County. Okay. Were you out toward Coke City? or? It, it's, it's about, do you know where uh, Askin is? Halfway to Vanceboro. Oh, yes. You that's turn and ask and go about five miles, and that's where I grew up. Okay. Yeah. Now, did you do the McElwain's at all? No. Okay. There's a, well, we're right now, the McElwain turf farm out there on Washington. Oh, Road. I know. Uh, uh, I forgot the name. Isla Gray. Yeah, Isla Gray. I know Isla Gray. And I um, can't remember, man, I can't remember. Or, or brother's name, but, uh, the barnacles. So they used to. They had a number of farms out there, and during the war, they could remember. There's, of course, a German prisoner of war camp here in town, yeah. out at uh, what is now the the park out there on Glen Burning, hmm. Glen Burning Park. And, during World War Two, there was. Yeah, it was a, a yeah. POW camp. There were there were hundreds of POW camps all across the country. And uh, Newburn had one. The, the true Nazis they put in a camp near near Raleigh. And the general rank and file who were not so Nazi, they were just in there because they had no choice or just because they were defending the nation or whatever, were in the local camps. A lot of them, a lot of them were prisoners from the Desert War, from the North African War, mm. came over. And they would just drive trucks in in the morning and the prisoners would load up on the truck and they'd drive them into town and turn them loose to work for people. Mm -hmm. And uh, there, there's some who did concrete work in town, worked in the, just, just wherever you'd find them. And the Mackwains remembered having them coming out. They'd come out every day and work the farm mm -hmm. until the end of the day. Then they'd hop the truck and ride back. And uh, she remembered, well, her brother remembered one, one of the prisoners saving, saving his life. Uh, over some kind of an act, incident with an axe. I wish I'd gone back and read the interviews to remind myself of some of this. And uh, one was a trooper mm -hmm. who fixed one of their clocks for them. And, and they, for a little girl, for the youngest daughter in the family, and then he would give her a, 
a, a couple of things he actually made by hand for her. It got stolen from her school. Oh, but uh, nonetheless, they managed to keep up with that family. And eventually that family, the, the prisoner, migrated from Germany and settled in Canada, I think. Oh, but it's just when I was growing up, mm -hmm. I would go with, with uh, my parents to sell tobacco at, in the fall. And they had uh, prisoners working there. They were young, blue-eyed, blonde-haired, good-looking <laughs> young men working there. We, my sister and I were fascinated by that. <laughs> I'm sure. <laughs> there are a lot of people who weren't even aware there was a prison war camp. It kept really quiet. It was like First, I've heard of it. Promoting. Pardon? You see for, how quiet it was? Yeah. <laughs> so it was for, I mean, I knew they were here, but I didn't know there was one in Newburn. That's that fascinating to me. I mean, I didn't know there was U-Bull warfare going off off our coast. Oh, my goodness. Until I moved down here in Pennsylvania, oh where I grew up. We never heard of it. As far mm -hmm. as we knew, the entire war was fought overseas. Now, yeah. during yeah. World War off the outer outer banks, yeah, they call it the Great and, Turkey Issue, and Ebo, uh, especially or the Zweisig, mm -hmm. uh, Zweisig Ludwig side, the, the second happy time. Uh, the first being when they first went to war with Britain, and the British hadn't really figured quite yet how to deal with uh, effectively. Well, they had in ways, but they but you know, there was a learning curve. Well, then after the U.S. entered uh, entered the war, the British Navy offered the American Navy to share their experience of, of fighting U-boats. And were rebuffed initially. Oh yeah, we know what we're doing. And then a month or two later, it's the sinking maybe figures. Guys <laughs> maybe, oh, we don't. Uh, maybe, maybe we don't. Maybe we don't. Maybe we like, don't. <laughs> what was that you were going to tell us about? Abdi so what did like what did the community like? There was no pushback, like because during World War Two, like I mean, obviously there was probably during a big hatred we towards. Because I know they kept it fairly quiet. No, I'm sure not. But but we used to camp. Mm -hmm. On Ocracoke and the Outer Banks, and you know there's a British graveyard there. Right. Today, right. Yes. That's when I discovered that okay. there was a lot of activity. In fact, oh, one of the campgrounds yeah. was called Billy Mitchell. Okay. Hmm. See, like he used Billy to Mitchell bomb. Was the Army Air Corps. Yeah, he was. Uh, he threw bombs out of the airplanes. I think was he one the one who basically showed that an airplane could take out a ship. He did, he did. With yeah, they had some World War One uh -huh. German ships. I remember one of them was named after one of my favorite parts of Germany, Old Friesland. And what he did, instead of having his planes dropping their bombs directly on the ships, he had them drop their bombs in the water next to the ship so that they um, so that they, they detonated the under the yeah essentially uh, essentially using his bombs like torpedoes. And, uh, and and sank uh, the Ostfriesland and maybe a couple of other German ships mm -hmm. too. The Ostfriesland was, was the you know, big battleship, and that was a real eye opener for a lot of people that uh, that these aircraft could destroy a battleship. Um, so that uh, let me share with you something musical about we're talking about the German POW camps. Okay. You know, they were sometimes getting to listen to what songs are on the radio. And there was one American pop song that was enormously popular with German POWs. Give me land, lots of land, with the starry skies above. Don't fence me in. <laughs> that, that song came out during the war, but uh, I have heard that several German POWs said, oh, and there was a song, you know, and we always sang this song. And that's what it was, was Don't Fence Me In. And after a war, a number of them did resettle in our area. Uh, now, in Camp Battle, we had... I think there were like two, three hundred prisoners there, I'm thinking, if I'm remembering right. I don't know. And they had, on all that time, they had one man who escaped. Mm -hmm. And he went missing for a while, and they eventually found him. He hanged himself oh. in the woods. <laughs> and they finally found him hanging, and, and it was after Roosevelt died. So do you remember, like, like how did the locals feel about having the German POWs here? Like, how, how did the locals feel about the German POWs? What was the reaction? That was none. Hmm. I, I, I don't remember. You don't remember? Yeah. You and your sister having some yeah, interest in this. They just took it for granted that that's just the way it was. Gotcha. And did, did a lot of those. You, you figure most of those young men are overseas. Right? Yeah, well, that's us. Yeah. And so, where's the labor force? And this is, of course, when women are starting to really come into the workforce because what else can you do? And so here comes this automatic labor force. Mm -hmm. You have no choice but to be here, and you're not too worried about them running away because if 
if I live in Germany fighting European war and I'm across the ocean as a prisoner, where can I go? Right. Yeah. Uh, it's now, did a lot of those, because, uh, mind you, they, they probably didn't speak English, right? Or for, for the most part, but did a lot of them end up, did they all get retributed back to Germany or did, be, or did some of them settle here? It, like, I think some came back. Um, they probably all repatriated, yeah. but some really liked it here. The war is over. Post-war economy in Germany yeah. was pretty rough. You know, the was, first uh, thing that happens is prisoners of war are being made to watch all these movies and things to show them how awful their country was during the war. Uh, the, <laughs> they're showing the movies of the death camps and things like that. And we're basically trying to teach them when you go back to your land, you don't want to be a Nazi again and, and look at these terrible things that people did. You want you to feel awful about yourself. And uh, many of them, it took two or three or four years or more for them to finally be repatriated into their own country. They went back to Europe and were imprisoned again. And it, it just, it was a long process for them. Of course, it was a lot better if you were a German prisoner of war on the American side or the English side than the, the Russian <laughs> side, where there was a pretty fair chance you were never going to come back again yeah. at all. Right, right. Yeah. But uh, it, it, was a, it was a long road of hope, hope for them. But yeah, some some resettled in America or in Canada or over across the way. Of course, also yeah, part of that having to do with the post-war German. Not remember, yeah, yeah, Germany is now partitioned. It's in four pieces, then it's two, and those and four pieces are in lots of pieces because most of the cities have been bombed into a Oh yeah, a lot absolutely. of the people you go home and you find out well you survived the war fine. Your family all died in the in the bombing. Right, and, and then a lot of people their mm -hmm. their home ended up being on the other side of the Iron Curtain. I knew, I've known several people, Germans of that, uh, of that generation that ended up, uh, settled one, 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 it was a Luftwaffe pilot I, I interviewed, settled in Austria because the part, um, his home was, was overrun by the Russians, apparently got back to it. He managed to salvage a few of his photographs that he had sent home. Uh, but that was all that was left of their house. It just been ransacked, but then. But then he managed to get back into the Western sector, so he knew he couldn't really go home. He didn't want to live live in the Russian, uh, Russian-controlled part of part of Germany. So he ended up settling in Salzburg, on Austria. Now, moving a few decades forward, do you remember the civil rights movement here at all? You don't remember any of the sit-ins or anything like that, or I must have. Well, I lived in the country. No. How did, well, out in the country, what was the relationship between the uh, whites and the blacks? We didn't have one. Okay. Simple enough. Uh, you're, you, you basically had your isolated, your very isolated community, especially right. in, the, in the country at that time. Well, there were no blacks in our neighborhood. I didn't uh -huh. know any black people. Okay. Okay. <coughs> Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, my growing up, I, the, the first black person I knew was in college. Now, I don't mean to sound so, stupid or anything like that, yeah. but when Caleb owned this house, was there electricity? Probably. Oh, yeah, I expect so, because it was 19, it was between 1916 and 1924, so yes, there would yes. be electricity. By that time, downtown New Bern had gotten electricity sewer and water lines you can see that if you walk along the streets here you'll see a house built in maybe the 1770s or 1780s and then two houses built in 1910 and then another house maybe 1810 and then two more houses built in 1910 and 1915. all of that is a function of bringing in water and sewer lines because before they have those the houses have to be a certain distance apart you don't want you don't want to have your well close to your uh your neighbor's outhouse Makes sense. People died. People died of typhoid a lot. And two people mm -hmm. near and dear to us. One of them almost died of typhoid in 1896, and mm -hmm. the other one was finally. finally and finally did died. this did this residence did it play any role in like his invention of Pepsi? Like, did he work on any of that here, or is this like did he own this like well after the fact? You got it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, he. I'm assuming he developed the dream mostly out of his pharmacy. Yeah. yeah. And, oh, uh, well, so he, he yeah. went bankrupt. Mm -hmm. While he lived here, That's because right. the price of sugar went so high, yeah, just during he could, World yeah War he could he factor. couldn't he mm. couldn't make he could not manufacture Pepsi at a at a at a full profit. Yeah, he 
So he went bankrupt and he had to, he lost his house. He built a large factory that is across from the, the library, the next block up from the library, which is all houses now. Uh, that factory eventually burned, I believe. But he didn't buy this house until not only had he had success selling the Pepsi-Cola syrups Correct. to pharmacies, but had gotten into bottling Pepsi. Bottling soft drinks was kind of a, a new thing at one time, and that was something that, that he and Pepsi-Cola got into. But as Sylvia quite correctly pointed out, the sugar sugar price fluctuations during and after World War I uh, were just horrendous for anyone who was producing something using sugar, because the sugar you know, you bought for, you know, this really high price one week is now worth half that much the next week. I've seen that in a lot of businesses. If people start speculating mm -hmm. in, uh, in a commodity, then the price starts becoming unstable. And anyone who's just trying to, to perform a service or produce a commodity mm -hmm. based on that, when people, speculation just uh, with the price fluctuations, it, it throws all kinds of people out of business. Yeah. I guess sometime today we'll talk about music, I hope. Yeah, I hope well, well, yes, yeah. yes, indeed. I don't know how far uh, along we are in our... Yeah, and uh, we're, we're... You're at 52 we're, minutes. Two moment. minutes? Could I, could I say something about yeah. it? It'll no, you're at 52 minutes, so technically oh, you have oh, eight. Oh, oh, we've got yeah. eight minutes. <laughs> I won't take all eight minutes, but I would like to mention a couple of music. Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll get to that in just a moment. Thank you. Um, now, here we are at the Bradham House, well, on the Bradham property, and right next well, to us in grass. that direction, if y'all look been around real fast as where the camera can't show. <laughs> and even if the camera does show, it's just going to show a brick wall. But beyond that is a house called the Louisiana House. And when Mr. Bradham lives here, in that house there lived a young lady, uh, probably not too young by that time, named Bayard Wooten. And she was a photographer and at the time also an illustrator. She painted postcards and did things like that. May have designed the first and, Pepsi Cola. Uh, almost certainly designed it. Uh, I have she designed the first logo, that old, the scripty looking Pepsi Cola, and they were using that logo for a version of it until the last 15, 20 years, I think, if you saw it still. And for a long time, it was a legend that she designed it, but um, a gentleman I know who was raised in this area now was in Washington, the state of Washington, that she did tons of research and digging around and finding all this stuff. He wants to build a museum to in this town. That's and wonderful. he found an old original handwritten letter of hers that included the Pepsi logo, a version of it. And that's pretty good evidence that she was indeed the designer of it. That's wonderful. Um, so, Byer so, Wooden, another yeah. figure like Mark Twain, the Mark Twain's cook, and Kayla Bradham. We, we, we're just tripping over history and down. Yeah, down this, down. Is a, this is one of the most one of the richest areas in this town right here to our local history and our, our national literature. Uh, so, so it's really interesting that way. Now, our last few minutes, let's let Simon uh, chatter away and let's go what's in on the, on the music scene. Yeah, I'm afraid I, I can't cover everything. And as we know from recent podcasts, when I tried to cover every band that was playing in the upcoming weekend, it was half the podcast. But I can tell you that this Saturday, uh, the the Bears are going to be loose in the Bermuda Triangle. Uh, the Bears, uh, a group, a vintage rock and roll group, I don't say oldies anymore, um, in, which, uh, in which I'm the bass player and play fiddle on some songs. We're going to be playing at Brewery 99, which is right at the, um, at the intersection of Pollock Street and Queen Street. It's one corner of the Bermuda Triangle of uh, New Bern. And there will be no cover charge. We'll start playing at 6.30 and finish up around 9 at Brewery 99. But wait, there's more. On Sunday afternoon, Fern and Tiff, a wonderful band performing uh, original music for the most part uh, from Beaufort, are performing a free concert at uh, Riverside United Methodist Church. That's at 405 A Street, uh, uh, not far from here, really, just up, up, up the road in the Riverside uh, District. Um, that's going to be Sunday at 3 o'clock, um, a free concert lasting about, about an hour. Fern and Tiff is the name of the band, a free concert of Riverside United Methodist Church, Sunday afternoon at 3. All right. Those are the two events that I know about. There's many, many more, I'm sure. Uh, yeah, to be uh, sure to, to look in on uh, the New Bern Live website and uh, uh, sign up for, the, for our daily uh, 
the, the growl every day. You can get online and uh, sign right up on that, and you'll get a daily listing of events going on in town, including much of the music and so on. Yes, Sylvia. I read it every morning. Indeed. And if she reads it, you need to read it. Never in line. All you people who tell me you, you can't stand reading online because you've got to hold the paper in your hands, well, well here, um, if, if Sylvia is willing to get online to read, you have no excuse. You have no excuse at all. Get online, check out New Burn Live, some, some great stories and information and all the, the news releases that uh, you'll no longer see in the first person. And uh, the, we, we are the place to get it. So I am Bill Hand and uh, Simon Spaulding, our, our good pal, and Sylvia Whitford, our very special guest. And then behind the camera, Mr. Eric Queen, our producer. And glad to see you. We'll see you in another week.